the land of smiles is undergoing an economic transformation as part of its Thailand 4.0 plan. What does it mean for companies and how can they tap into new areas of growth? We find out on Managing Asia. Thailand has made sustainability a priority in its 20-year economic roadmap, which began in 2016. Under the plan, the country is steering policies to change industries through innovation and technology, while also focusing on social and environmental sustainability. And we've seen in our Thailand Focus show so far, major areas of focus include key infrastructure, the agri-food industry, electric car manufacturing, and the medical sector. The government hopes its initiatives will see the country become carbon neutral by 2050 and be at net zero when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions by 2065. How will those targets affect Thai companies? We find out in the last of our episodes focusing on Thailand. Welcome to Managing Asia. To delve deeper into the topic, I'll be joined by our esteemed panelists. We have Kocha Khan Avarakom, founder and director of the landscape architecture firm Land Process, as well as the founder of Pora City Network, a non-profit that works with vulnerable communities to co-design water management solutions. We also have Rungrot Rangsiopad, president and CEO of SCG, which has businesses in cement, building materials, chemicals, and packaging, and Harold Ling, chairman and president of Begrim, a conglomerate with interests in power, real estate, transport, and infrastructure. A warm welcome to my panelists for joining me here today. Kochakan, let me start with you first. What role do you see big businesses playing in steering Thailand towards a more sustainable future? Well, um, as a landscape architect and working in this built environment, I think... Um, the thing that um, my profession are struggling is finding the sustained um, materials. And I think the big business, especially in this private sector, the big corporation could help um, the construction sector, which is um, definitely, as we know that the construction section um, already working on this carbon emission, which is like 40% of all other um, global sectors. So having this um, PPP together, working together, I think that would help a lot in to help the world achieve the goal at 1.5 degrees, yes. And how big a role do you see big business in Thailand playing versus policy makers? Well, I guess for the private sector, as I, um, let's say like concrete or solar panels, there's not many like big corporations in the field and if they can succeed to um, help achieve this goal especially when it's come to um, esg it's not about um, the cost base but it's turned to be the value base working together with the policy maker we better off um, for our carbon emission in thailand okay and speaking of big business uh, Rungrod, you are the CEO of SCG. How are you actually integrating ESG systems and practices into your overall operations? I, I think, you know, the, we, we look at a few things, you know. The, um, first of all, the, we know that uh, as a business, we deal a lot with uh, natural resources, we deal a lot with energies, we deal a lot with uh, uh, using the, a lot of the natural the, uh, uh, conditions. So it's also important to, to recognize that, you know, by integrating the ESG into our business model, we do have to make sure that it stay, you know, within our business plan, it stay with our long-term plan, and it's also something that we can measure, which is the performance metrics uh, has to be included uh, for the ESG uh, perspective as well. Hmm. Harold? How much progress have you made transforming the power generation sector in the country? And what's the biggest challenge you face making that transition? Actually, now in all over the world, there's so much demand for renewable energy. So wherever we go abroad, we're mainly in renewable energy. And Thailand is 
we, we have done as much as we could do. We support a lot of industries. And so we are maybe in the most industrial parks in Thailand, Vietnam, and Cambodia. So these industries, they need uninterrupted power supply. And that is not yet really possible on a bigger scale, scale with uh, only renewable energy, unless you do make solar on the, on the dam, which we have done for EGAT. So I think we all have to try to find a way to both serve our customers well with uninterrupted electricity and steam, and at the same time, constantly remove our air pollution. These days, we know that investors really want data and information as a gauge of how you're meeting your SDG goals and ESG commitments, Rungrot. At SEG, what sort of metrics and standards do you use to monitor and track your progress? We have four main tracks. One is we measure uh, the uh, percentage of the energy transitions that uh, we have done. Secondly is the going, the going green. For example, you know, uh, last year uh, we introduced the cement that is 10% uh, less in terms of the uh, carbon uh, in, in, uh, for making it. The third one, this is a little bit uh, challenging to measure. Uh, which is basically social impact. Uh, we look at what kind of activities that we are doing in order to help the society uh, be better, uh, be more prepared for the new economy. For example, like training in digital, training in smart uh, uh, concept, like in smart construction, green construction, and so on and so forth. And uh, the last one is the collaboration. Three years ago, we formed a group uh, that uh, you know have been focusing on the circular economy with the construction companies. So we look into that, and then uh, we take a look at you know uh, within that group uh, of uh, of uh, consortium, uh, what kind of values we bringing in, and uh, what kind of impact uh, to the environments that uh, this consortium uh, has been doing. Harold, how do you measure your progress and your impact? Okay. So now we have been um, communicating with the Dow Jones Sustainability Index now for quite a while and MSCI Index. So we, we look at what they measure or want us to measure. So we do that uh, now in quite, quite detail. For us, of course, the most important is the, the carbon dioxide, the NOx, and whether there's any SOx at all. So we try to be there really at the forefront, our machines constantly are the ones that have the highest efficiency. So we use the least gas per kilowatt hour. And also, of course, like on the road, then what about the social impact and the social impact inside? And so, you know, we try to do business with compassion. Kocha Khan, as an architect, um, how do you ensure that the materials you use for your building and infrastructure are sustainable? I think for the designer point of view, we still need a better communication on this. And, but that's like um, really a transparency of the process. Everything we talk about right now is about the process because the most carbon emission is not in the product, but it's actually in the making of the process. And I think it's the social factor that um, um, both of the gentlemen mentioned cannot be deprived from the environmental um, value. These two things have to be measurement together because if we make it separate, that means we didn't give enough value to the environment. Even the society is good. We cannot only do the business that really focus on the human needs only, but I think it's like the overall, these two things have to play role as one. We conducted a poll online where we asked the question, what do you think is most pressing when it comes to ESG? Is it reducing emissions, environmental degradation, education and reskilling, or social well-being? Uh, the results highlighted reducing emissions and education and reskilling as the top two imperatives. Rungrat, do you agree with the poll? What are you urgently addressing at SEG? I, I think I, uh, I do agree, and, and, and the main reason is that I have to agree. You know, our business itself is uh, very much, uh, like I mentioned, uh, dealing with energy, dealing with uh, uh, natural resources. So how, how to make sure that while doing that, you know, we create the business model that can sustainably uh, conducting the business 
uh, at the same time without impact negative uh, to the environment. But at the same time, the doing your part as the, as the corporate uh, citizen uh, to also help uh, to, to do more training, uh, to do more reskilling, uh, or even the, hopefully, you know, to, to bridge the gap of the income. Harold? Well, first of all, we have to look after the environment. And I think not only in the sense that uh, don't pollute, but also in the sense that that especially the young uh, generation experience the beauty of the environment. When you go and, and touch nature, then there's something real. And I think this is really important. So I think education, if you talk about Thailand, education is really there on top because if we don't have the right mindset and the right understanding, then the environment will be exploited more and more. We conducted a second poll online and asked the question, what limits you from being sustainable? Is it identifying the tools, the issue of cost, the problem of infrastructure, or the access to advice? And when we looked at the results, cost was highlighted as the biggest problem. Now, Kocha Khan, this is something I know you face on a daily basis with your clients. How do you address this problem when they tell you it's simply too expensive to be sustainable? <laughs> Yes, I think that's that's so true because when you want to fix the climate change and all these community products have to be um, sustainable and affordable because if it's only expensive, you only serve a certain market. So I think uh, when it's come to the cause, um, is when it's come to sustainability, it definitely need a, a sustained business model to combine together and at the moment, it's still very hard for, for us as is the designer to convince that. But as we can see the progress, like let's say having the solar roof or doing the green roof 10 years ago, all my client would all mostly would say no because it's actually adding up like three times, of course. But right now it's become more like a common value that we have we have to do it. Okay, so change is actually happening. Rungot, let me ask you, uh, at SCG, is there a limit as to what you and the board will spend to be sustainable? Um, yes, actually, you know, I think uh, what we're trying to do is that, uh, you know, we're trying to establish the, the incentive for our business to innovate. But any changes uh, have some cost into it. So we try to make sure that uh, we put a price tag. You know, we call it internal carbon pricing. Basically, you know, that's our own internal credits that we give to the business unit in order to allow them to introduce the products or to invest in the products. It's something that uh, the business have to have to be thinking that you know they're not only uh, losing by investing in the new products or uh, the process that use less energies or use less carbon, but at the same time, they have some internal benefit as well. And Harold, as the president of Thailand's oldest conglomerate, uh, do you have your own internal carbon pricing or credits as well? <laughs> not yet. No, I don't think it's a good idea. So uh, carbon pricing will come in, in Europe. It's a big thing. So uh, what we what we're looking now also is how can we in Europe uh, go with countries where they have a lot of electricity consumption from coal and produce renewable energy or energy from gas so that they can uh, mitigate these carbon credits they have to pay. So um, we, haven't, we haven't done that, but we try to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions and try to compensate with forestry and with renewable energy. This whole issue of cost that we're talking about raises the question of striking the right balance between doing what is good for the environment and the community and doing what is good for investors and shareholders. How exactly do you align the two and strike the right balance? Rungra, how do you approach this as a listed company? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to go to the business or the investment decisions that have the highest environmental impact. Even with the lower or sometimes not making any money, we will do it as well. At the same time, uh, we try to cut 
you know, the business that have the uh, negative or no, uh, no environmental impact uh, uh, from the investment uh, pool uh, options that, uh, that we have to make. Harold, where do you see yourself at Bigram when it comes to making that choice? At Bigram, we look at everything long term. So we are not interested in some short term transaction. So we, we, we are in so many areas where we think we have a really great positive impact, like in the, our whole healthcare sector, in the building sector, where we, uh, where we can uh, bring healthy buildings to life and low energy consumption. And in the power sector, we, we can do the easy thing, which is to sell all the gas-fired power plants and then only do renewable, and then you say we're 100% ESG. Or you can stick with your customers and help them to keep on producing, and at the same time, every day, try to find a way how to reduce the environment impact and then uh, offset it also in some other place. Kosha Khan, sustainability versus profitability. Would you turn down lucrative projects if you felt they were not sustainable, if you felt they were not green enough for you? So I think while working with the client is, is, is the power that designer can play part of making this a right decision. So if it's not sustained, it's your job to make it sustained. But only if when all the commitment or the decision have been made and haven't followed through what we as a group has been um, um, consensus. I think that's, that's, the, that's the question that are we going to continue or am I going to continue as a designer of this project? Mm. So yes. how many projects have you turned down as a result of those clients that you say who don't listen to you? So, so far, we actually, well, it's a process. So there's a lot of convincing, making the client, making the contractor be on track of what we already have. So far, I have none project that I've been rejected yet. But yes, it's hopefully not in the future as well. Let's talk about leadership because um, this is very important in driving ESG and SDG goals. Harold, you've set a vision for Bigrim to be carbon neutral by 2050. What leadership will you provide to meet that target? So first of all, what you asked before, yeah? do we reject projects which we think are not sustainable? And that is the truth. We have rejected many projects because they think How they lead many? us away from where we want to be. Maybe 10. So not 100 because people after a while, they don't bring these projects to you anymore. Then you have a name that, okay, it's no use to go there. So, um, as I said before, we, we try to go as renewable as possible all the time. And then I think when we say we do business with compassion, you have to always really think about the impact on society. Was it, is it positive or, or negative? So whatever we see that is not positive impact, we don't do. As a leader, you always have to be in the forefront and go ahead and be a good example so that everybody thinks that it's the right direction to take because otherwise you just do what you have always been doing and that's much more comfortable. Arun Grot, uh, as CEO of SCG, um, you have also set a goal for the company to reduce your carbon emissions by 20% by the end of the decade. Do you have the right team in place? Yes, we do, but uh, probably not enough. Uh, this carbon neutral um, trend, if uh, we do it right, I do believe that this is uh, something that uh, we can take this opportunity to transform our business to be greener, to be more sustainable, uh, regardless of what we have done in the past. So one thing that uh, I'm trying to do is that I'm spending between half or 60% of my time on this ESG. Uh, when you're spending more time, you know, uh, particularly if you're at the top of the organizations, uh, people do understand what you mean. And at the same time, it's uh, a little bit easier to attract uh, good uh, younger talent uh, to join this, uh, this force uh, within the company. Do you think you have the right culture in place at SCG to make that transformation? I'm quite fortunate in that sense that uh, we have the people that, that do have the attitude uh, uh, I believe the right attitude to be able to make uh, this kind of transformation. 
uh, it's now a matter of executing it and uh, making sure that uh, you know uh, we do invest uh, in the, something new that uh, some technologies that we have not known uh, uh, in the past and, and try to use that uh, learning or that technologies in order to make this transformation. Mm. And Kocha Khan, when it comes to future buildings and infrastructure, where do you think you can lead and make a difference and make an impact? I think we are using our innovation and designer with whatever given at the present, as efficient as possible and as creative as possible. And since I'm with like this um, two great impact leader, and we're not only talking about the leadership, but we're talking about leadership in the leader. So I think we are having our part to play. And I, as, um, as a system, we cannot neglect um, it, both like all your supply chain or SME that working with this big corporation as well. So I think as a designer, we try to be like a glue to all these components and creating um, a first step of innovation that can tackle the climate crisis, especially in Thailand. Mm -hmm. And before I let you go, I want to ask three of you to give last advice for businesses and for CEOs on how to make that important transformation to drive ESG as part of Thailand 4.0. Coach Akon, quick advice from you. Uh, my advice and my ask for the two gentlemen, and I'm sure that with a big corporation, if um, not many of you have uh, have changed and raised to resilience um, fast enough, Thailand will be better off with the carbon emission and our goal will be really more um, clear and that's definitely the transparency and the better communication with all the ecosystem that are uh, applying around um, your products or um, either with the design profession as well. So I hope that definitely younger generation can be, can be part of this and they want to invest in their future and we should help them. Rungrat. Um, I think the, this challenge is, is, uh, is uh, very significant. And uh, my advice is the, for the leader of the companies uh, uh, to spend your time, you know, to uh, make the commitment most important commitment is your time. And uh, once you commit your time, uh, then people uh, will know that uh, you really mean uh, what you're saying. And I think that's the, that's the most important things that you can do in order to push and at the same time providing incentive uh, for everyone within your organizations uh, to move in this direction. And last but not least, Harold, what advice could you leave CEOs and businesses? I think always a great method is to get everybody involved and enticed and energized around such a sharp subject. And the, I think the leader has to be at the forefront. You have to really walk the talk or your management team has to do that. And you sure have to show results and communicate them. Because nowadays everybody wants to go into that direction. And when they see that the whole company is committed to that, then I think we can, we can achieve uh, our goals really well. When, with the full support of everybody in the company. And we will leave it there. We appreciate your time joining us here on Managing Asia today. I hope you've enjoyed our discussion. For more highlights, do check us online at managingasia.cnbc.com. I'm Christine Tan. Thanks for watching.